welcome to Mount of Olives Church. Thank you for taking the time to come and worship from your home, wherever that may be. My name is Michelle Danley, and I'm the Children's Ministry Director here at Mount of Olives Church. I'm actually filming today from Kids City. If you could see, I'm in this wonderful, wonderful, colorful, Oh, building. We wanted to let you know that Pastor Stewart will be sharing an update on all of us gathering together here at Mount of Olives campus. I know so many of you have been asking and writing us notes, so we thought it's a time Pastor Stewart wants to share this update with all of you. So stick through the service, and we really look forward to seeing all of you again. We miss our family so much but we really wanna stay connected. So we're hoping all the kids are able to view the Mount of Olives Kids City services. We do services every Sunday, so tune in, tune in. We wanna make sure that everyone is connected. Are you connected? Visit our Moo website, that's moochurch.org, and go ahead and fill out the communication card. We would really love to connect you and get to know you. Put your prayer requests on that also. We have many prayer warriors that want to pray for you. Again, stay connected with each other. Pick up the phone and call your neighbor. Call the lady down the street. Call the grandkids. Stay connected with each other. I'm so excited now to worship together. Are you ready? Let's go ahead and worship. Let us begin. Let us join together as we confess our faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You know, Shakespeare once observed through Prince Hamlet, there is nothing either good or bad in life, but thinking makes it so. In other words, how we interpret the events of life determines how we feel about life. And if that's the case, then I would suggest we ought to get some divine guidance into how we interpret events, especially these days with everything that's happening. So I love that the church calendar directs us today to focus on the Holy Spirit because empowering insight is one of the Holy Spirit's most powerful gifts. And this next song um, has the words in it that I just love and I say kind of over and over. It says, when you do what only you can do, it changes us. It changes what we see and what we seek. In other words, it changes what we perceive and it changes what we pursue.
Let us join together in the prayer of the day. Almighty Father, just as the outpouring of your Holy Spirit on Pentecost transformed the lives of your disciples, may the power of your Spirit refine and renew us. May we move in the power of your Spirit, and may our lives and ministries be infused with your divine touch. May we serve you faithfully in praise, prayer, and loving service to others as we are transformed by the power of your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, Mount of Olives. The scripture reading today is from the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. So when the Lord had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Here ends the reading. Well, this is Pentecost Sunday. This is the birthday of the church. So happy birthday, happy birthday. We call this the birthday of the church because this is the day when the Holy Spirit fell on those early disciples and they were empowered to be a witness for Christ throughout the world. And so we celebrate this day as the birthday of the church. Christmas is not the birthday of the church, it is Pentecost. And so just before Jesus ascended into heaven, after his resurrection, he said these words from Acts chapter 1, verses 6 to 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And the Greek word here, the original word in the original language, is the word dunamin. It's where we get the word dynamite from. It's a dynamite kind of power. It is a very strong force of God's very presence himself coming to live within us. In those early days of the early church, they needed this kind of Holy Spirit power. When you think about what was going on just a little over a month before Jesus makes this promise and ascends to the Heavenly Father, you begin to see how much they needed this power. For most of the ministry of Jesus, they never truly understood the mission he was giving them. They were always confused, always questioning it, always going in different directions than he was. And then when he was arrested, Peter, who said he would never deny him, denied him three times. And then when he's hanging on a cross and he dies, the disciples run and hide. They're behind locked doors because they're afraid for their life. They believe they're going to be next. They need this Holy Spirit power. Even in the early church, they needed this power. The early church, they decided that the gospel was just meant for fellow Jews. They never really understood what Jesus meant when he said, go and make disciples of all nations. And so there was much debate. There was much confusion. They were getting arrested for preaching the gospel. It was a difficult time in the early church. They needed the power of the Holy Spirit. And over time, the Holy Spirit began to do a mighty work in them. They began to see the vision that Christ had for the church. They went into Asia Minor and started preaching among the non-Jews, the Gentiles, and bringing many to faith. And so they started churches after churches after churches, and, and now there are billions and billions of believers in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. The power of the Holy Spirit is mighty. They needed it then. And we still need the power of the Holy Spirit now. I want to spend some time today talking about that power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Many years ago, there was a TV show where a bodybuilder got on the stage. And, you know, we've all seen this where they flex their muscles and the crowd cheers. And everybody's very excited and nobody's ever seen anybody with so many muscles. And the host of the show came over to this man and he said to him, so what do you use those muscles for? And the man smiled and turned to the audience and began to flex his muscles again. And so the host said, and the crowd started to cheer, and, and then the host said, but what do you use those muscles for? And, and the man turned again and showed his muscles off, flexed, and 
impressed everybody, and the crowd went wild. And then they asked him a third time. And the man just went over and sat down. He had nothing to say. What are those muscles for? Here was a man with all kinds of power, but no purpose. That's what happens to many believers. We have all this power, but we don't understand it's meant for a purpose. We are meant to serve Jesus Christ and live for him, and the power of the Holy Spirit is meant to be our strength. Now notice what Jesus said. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses. One of the first uses of the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives is meant to be a witness for him. In my devotions through the years in the morning, often I have prayed, Lord, send someone to me that I can tell him about Jesus. Just send someone to me. And uh, quite often it would happen. Still does. I would be maybe in a restaurant. Oh, you remember what those are. You know, places where you sit and you eat and you talk with friends. But I'd be in a restaurant and I'd get into a conversation with somebody, a total stranger sometimes, and they'd start to tell me about various challenges in their life. And it would always lead to an opportunity to tell them how Jesus loved them and had a plan for their life and how through his death and resurrection they could be cleansed and washed and made new again and have eternal life. And then I would invite them to church. In fact, I've had times where I haven't even asked and prayed for that. And I've had these encounters with people. Sometimes some of you have even been with me in those moments. And it's been amazing what happens. We're supposed to be open to the promptings of the Spirit to be able to give witness for Jesus Christ in those moments. You will be my witnesses. Now the Holy Spirit is also meant to guide us, to strengthen us in times like this, to strengthen us in times of trouble and challenge. And the Holy Spirit is also meant to be our teacher. I invite you to look with me at this passage in the Gospel of John the 14th chapter, and the 25th and 26th verse. I have said these things to you while I am still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. The Holy Spirit will be our teacher. He will bring to remembrance all that Jesus has taught and taught us all that we need to know. How wonderful, how amazing. You know, I've seen this happen uh, in our lives where there's a Bible verse we haven't understood for a long, long time, and then all of a sudden we have this aha moment, and we realize what it means and have a deeper understanding of the passage. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, bringing to remembrance all that Jesus taught and all that we need to know. But you know, sometimes the Holy Spirit is speaking to us in our lives, and we don't hear anything. It's as if we're almost deaf, we're hard of hearing, and the Holy Spirit is trying to speak to us, and we don't hear the voice of the Spirit. It reminds me about an older man who was taken by a friend of the doctor, and he had many complaints, and one of them was that he had a hard time hearing. And so the doctor explained to him that this happens as we get older, sometimes we lose some of our hearing, and then the, the doctor began to examine the man. And when he looked in his ear, he couldn't believe it. There was years of earwax buildup that had dried. No wonder the man couldn't hear. It must have happened uh, slowly over time and he didn't notice, which sometimes is what happens to us with our spiritual hearing. Well, the doctor flushed it out with warm water and a solution. And when the man left the doctor's office, he said, this is a miracle. I can hear again. So what is it that blocks our hearing? What is the earwax in our life that keeps us from hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit and experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit? Well, I think quite often it's religion. You know, we say at Mount of Olives quite often we don't believe in religion. We believe in a relationship with Almighty God through Jesus Christ. We don't believe in religion. Religion doesn't work. You see, the problem with religion is that we get stuck in, in rituals and, and rites and routines and uh, we get to the point where we, we can, don't even have to think about it. We can say the Apostles' Creed from memory and don't give it much thought. We can pray the Lord's Prayer in a mindless fashion because we know it by heart. And then we just go through the motions. 
Sometimes we do this because our parents did this and we just do what we've always done and we kind of robotically go through the Christian faith. That's religion. Oftentimes it's because we want to be in charge and in control. Another aspect of religion is something we call works righteousness. Works righteousness is where I believe I can be righteous before God by my own good efforts. We think that God is going to compare me to other people. And when God compares me to others, and especially those who are worse than I am, I'm going to look pretty good, and he's going to smile on me, and and he's going to give me eternal life. But you see, God never does that. God never compares us to other people. He instead compares us to himself and to his law. And when we begin to realize that he compares us to his law, we begin to realize, I need a savior. I can't do this on my own. I need someone who will pay the price for my broken, sinful condition. I need a Savior. And that's when we begin to realize that God in Christ Jesus has provided that through his cross and resurrection. I can't be righteous through my own good efforts. I'm made righteous because of what Christ has done for me at the cross. And then sometimes in religion we get stuck in something called cheap grace. That's a term coined by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Cheap grace. What does it mean? It means that we treat the grace of God in a cheap fashion. But you see, grace is costly. It cost God the cross. God himself came in Jesus Christ, died on a cross, was raised again from the dead, that we might have this grace, this unmerited favor, this forgiveness, this eternal life. It's very, very costly. It might be free to you and to me, but it's costly to God. And when we understand the cost, It changes our outlook, changes our attitude. We treat God's grace with greater respect. We don't want to be flippant about it. We don't want to misuse it. We want to show thankfulness and gratitude by living a life that is pleasing to him, not because we hope to earn heaven, but because we already have it. And we want to honor the one who made it possible. So often we get stuck in religion. And that keeps us from hearing the the voice of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is wanting to speak to us, to teach us, to guide us, to direct our path. But quite often, as we're stuck in religion, we don't hear the voice. But there's another reason why we don't always hear the voice. One of the other reasons is because, and, and that we don't hear and experience the power of the Holy Spirit, because you see, the power of the Holy Spirit is not a, a symbolic power. It's a real power that you and I can have in our life. It is genuine, and we can have an experience of the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And so that power sometimes gets derailed, as it were. You know, um, a locomotive, when you sit at a, a, a light as the bars come down and the lights are flashing and the train goes by, sometimes it takes quite a while, doesn't it? And we've seen pictures of trains that are like two and three miles long. And the powerful locomotive is pulling that train filled with manufactured goods and cargo and heavy equipment and and, uh, even passengers. And it's carrying thousands and thousands of tons of, of weight. And yet that locomotive with all those trains, two miles worth, is able to climb mountains, go through rugged terrain. It's a powerful engineering feat when you really think about it. But you realize there's one thing that can prevent a train from going any farther, even by one inch. And that's if it's off the track. If a train is not on the track, it can't even go a few feet. The track is essential. And I would say the same thing is true uh, for the Christian. To experience the power of God, like the power of that locomotive, means we've got to be on on a track. And what does that track consist of? Well, it consists of Bible study, to be in the Word of God where the Holy Spirit can speak to me, to where I study the Word of God on a regular basis. I read the Bible on a daily basis. I want to know what the, what the Lord of heaven and earth has to say to me. Bible study is essential. Faith grows through the Word of God. And then prayer becomes another part of being on track and allowing the power of the Holy Spirit to come into my life. The Bible says, pray without ceasing. We're to constantly be in prayer. And as we engage in prayer, 
not ritualistic prayer, but just a, a conversation from our heart and our soul, we grow in relationship with him. We begin to have an intimate relationship with the God of heaven and earth. How wonderful. And then serving him can be another way in which we get on track. Because as you serve him, you begin to grow. As we give to him through our time and our talents and our treasures, we begin to grow. As we grow in our giving of our, our gifts to him and not make them secondhand or pocket change or what's left over, when we give sacrificially to him, we begin to grow because we grow in trust. And so to be on track for the power of the Holy Spirit to be at work in our life is very, very important. Just like that locomotive has to be on the track to do all its mighty work. You and I need to be on a track so the power of the Holy Spirit can be infused in our life and we can be all that God is calling us to be. See, that's what happened to those early disciples. Not only did they receive the power of the Holy Spirit, but they were on track so that the power of the Holy Spirit could be used in their life. They were deeply engaged in study of the Word of God and in prayer and in community, small groups and fellowship, and they were serving the Lord with their very lives. You and I need to be on that kind of track. Now, I hope during this pandemic, as we come out of it, and we enter into a new phase in the life of our church, my prayer is that we will use this Pentecost power in our life, that we'll get on track, that if you haven't been studying your Bible, you'll begin to do so. Start with the Gospel of John and read it, a, par a, a chapter a day. Be in prayer daily and get involved in a small group and then begin to serve the Lord somewhere. We call that the big promise, that if you do those things, your life will be better one year from now. But there's something else I want to talk about. And that is something that I've noticed through the years where I've seen the power of the Holy Spirit demonstrated in a very mighty way. You know, I've been a Christian all my life. I have been a pastor for many decades. I've been in the church all my life. And I've seen all kinds of experiences. I've been in the seminary. I've been in uh, little churches and large churches. I've been in meetings in Pentecostal churches and watched people speak in tongue and give prophecy. I have been in other church settings. I've been in Baptist churches and Presbyterian churches, I've preached in Episcopal churches. I, I've been in many settings. I've been in prayer meetings where we pray, and, and I've been in meetings where there's been healing. And so I wouldn't say I've seen it all, but I've seen quite a bit. But there's been one place where I've seen the power of the Holy Spirit humbly, practically, consistently at work in people's life. And that has been Lutheran Curcio. You've heard me talk about it. It's a three-day discipleship program where you discover the grace of God, where you discover the power of the Holy Spirit in a loving, compassionate, kind manner. And I just watch it change people in a deep and relevant way where they experience this power of the Holy Spirit. My prayer is that the Pentecostal Spirit, Holy Spirit, will move your heart and your life to, to get on track, to begin to allow the Holy Spirit to work in your life in a new way. It's like we've got this mighty power within us that we're not harnessing. We need to get on track and allow the Holy Spirit to do a new work in our life. So happy birthday, church. Let it be a time of renewal and strengthening and new directions. Pray with me this morning. Jesus, we thank you that you promised to send the Holy Spirit and that you did so, and that through the Holy Spirit we can be renewed and strengthened, that we can learn more about you and what we need to do and to be. So do a new work in us, Lord. Give us an open mind to trying something new so that your spirit might be unleashed in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you on this Pentecost Sunday.
so glad you could join us on this Pentecost Sunday. And now I want to take a moment with you to share with you some of the planning that we've been doing in consultation with our church council and our staff to try to figure out a way forward to gather together again in worship. Recently, the governor made the announcement that churches can reopen, but there are many restrictions. For example, you have to, you can only have a hundred people in the worship center at any given time for worship. In addition to that, we're going to have to wear face masks. We're going to have to take people's temperatures. We're going to have to sanitize the building between services. And uh, we're going to have to do many other things to be able to uh, worship together, like social distancing. It'll be very important to do that. So we're going to start slowly. We started today by encouraging you through email to gather together in small groups to watch the broadcast. And if you don't have a small group, just let us know and we'll help put one together so you can watch us again next weekend. And so next weekend, again, we'll ask you to join together as small groups 
Maybe have a barbecue afterwards, practice social distancing for groups uh, 10 or less. Some groups may have to split and be two different groups meeting in two different homes. But this is how the church got started, you know, was meeting in homes. And so we're just doing what is our heritage, going back to the basics. But we hope you'll gather and watch the broadcast together. And then going forward, we're going to continue live streaming because we know that there are those who for many reasons are not able to join us in a live worship experience. Maybe for health reasons, maybe they're uncomfortable. Uh, whatever it is, we, uh, we honor that and we want you to know we're going to continue both the traditional and contemporary live streaming services going forward. And then on the next phase, on June 14th, uh, and the 21st of June, we're going to have a, a, a five o'clock service in the worship center for 100 people. It'll be a ticketed event where you'll have to have a ticket to come. And once again, we're going to have to wear our face masks and do social distancing and all those required activities. And then coming up on June 28th and, and July 5th, we will start the next phase where we will have a, a traditional service and a contemporary service in the worship center. And uh, as we go along in the weeks after that, we hope if needed, we can open up our other buildings like the Rock and the New Creation Center and add more seating capacity. So we hope you'll understand, you know, we've always been an entrepreneurial church, always willing to experiment. And this is no different now. We're going to have to experiment. We're gonna modify this plan as we go along and make changes and try to be responsive to your needs. So we hope that you'll understand why we're doing what we're doing. We're gonna need more volunteers. We're desperately in need of volunteers for the many tasks involved. So we hope that you'll let us know that you will be a volunteer. And so we will be experimenting and trying different ways to do this. And, uh, and we want you to know your safety is of the, of the most important concern to us. So if you don't feel comfortable coming or you have health concerns and health issues, stay at home, watch us online. We're going to continue to offer both in the weeks ahead. And uh, we want you to know that if you have more questions, there'll be a detailed explanation on our website uh, very soon, perhaps hopefully today. So God bless you and know that, you know, the church is never closed. The church has never been closed. We have been functioning because the church is not a building. The church is God's gathered people. The word church in the original language is the word ecclesia. It means the called out ones, the ones who have been called out of the world into fellowship together. And we have been doing that. We've been gathered for the word of God. We've been praying together. We've been preaching and teaching the word. We've been Zooming our small group meetings. Uh, we've been gathering together, but we've just done it a little differently. You know, I was reminded today that in 1527, Martin Luther went through a similar kind of pandemic and he did some of the same things we're doing right now. And so the church has a heritage, especially we Lutherans. We've been through this before, even though it might be before our lifetime, but the church never stopped. In Martin Luther's day, he did social distancing and taking care of one another and so what we want to do throughout all of this is love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And uh, we're trying to do the right thing, the loving thing, and to carry on the mission of Christ in the world. So God bless you. Gather together in your small groups next weekend, and let's carry on as God's church. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallelujah, be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and grant you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, today and always. Amen. 
Take me by the hand, walk with me by quiet streams. Need to hear the wind, feel the ground beneath my feet. Thank、you